take a second for it to come up on your screens. Um, and then we'll be ready to move on. And uh, so with that, I'm going to just briefly review the agenda. Uh, and before I introduce Dr. Finnegan, I want to give you a brief introduction to the Relney Urban School Improvement Alliance, which is sponsoring this event. After Dr. Finnegan speaks, she will entertain questions in a session facilitated by Dr. Andrew Petrosino, one of the researchers in the team of three of us who support this alliance. Then Susan Yom, who's Director of Research Assessment and Accountability in the New Rochelle School District, will offer a response. And finally, David Phillips, the third member of our team, will facilitate a discussion that includes both presenters. And he'll also add some further information at the end of the session about our uh, USIA research agenda. Before I move on, just to reiterate what Dave, Peter has probably already told you, please use the chat box on the left to submit your questions as, as um, <clears throat> you don't have a verbal access to this webinar. So um, those of us who are on the team will be monitoring that for questions as, as, you, as the presentations go along. Uh, we'll address clarifying questions as soon as we can, and then uh, any substantive questions will be um, will uh, come up. We'll bring up during the question and answer period. So uh, please, um, we will monitor that and feel free to use the chat, uh, as that's a great way of, of keeping this uh, as interactive as possible. A little bit about the Urban School Improvement Alliance. It consists of research directors, or their equivalent, of mid-sized urban districts in our region, which comprises New York, New England, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this is our, our statement of, of, of purpose, which is, is building capacity in those to use data. And also interested in its members are interested in examining school performance within the largest social, organizational, and instructional contexts. And that's uh, specifically why we've uh, invited Dr. Carrigan, uh, Cara Finnegan to uh, talk with us, because uh, <coughs> she really has some very interesting things to say about that larger context. Just a, a brief uh, look at who our members are, from Providence, Brockton, Syracuse, Worcester, New Haven, uh, Lowell, Yonkers, and uh, New Rochelle. We're always interested in involving in this alliance other mid-sized urban districts in our region. And if you fit that role and would like to explore, explore participation, please contact me in the, uh, my email on that of the other members of the team. Uh, the ad address is, will be uh, at the end of this presentation. So um, with that, I want to move on to the featured presentation. And uh, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Cara Fittigan, Associate Professor of Educational Policy at the Warner School of Education at the University of Rochester in New York. Dr. Finnegan began her work in education as a substitute teacher in Anchorage, Alaska. She has conducted research and evaluations of K-12 educational policies and programs at the local, state, and federal levels for nearly 20 years through her work with several prominent national research organizations. She joined the Warner School in 2003, where she teaches in the Educational Leadership Program. Cara Finnegan has written extensively on the topics of low-performing schools and high-stakes accountability, principal leadership, teacher motivation, and school choice. Finnegan's research blends perspectives of education, sociology, and political science. She employs both qualitative and quantitative methods, including social network analysis, something which you'll talk about in a while. And her focus often is on urban school districts. She's published in many leading journals, including the American Educational Research Journal, Journal of Educational Change, Educational Policy, and Educational Administration Quarterly, as well as practitioner-oriented journals such as School Business Affairs and District Administration. The aspect of Dr. Finnegan's current research that is the topic of today's session is her work on social network analysis in low-performing schools and districts. We know, for example, that the current turnaround model of school improvement results in failure far more often than in success. 
We also know that improving schools without attending to districts often leads to long-term failure. Surely there are ways of thinking about and working towards district and school improvement that includes important issues that we have so far neglected. Kara Finnegan offers some insightful ideas that we hope will be useful to you. And with that, I will turn this over to Kara. Welcome, Kara Finnegan. Thanks. Um, thank you to the Urban School Improvement Alliance for inviting me today to participate in this bridge webinar. I would love if we were all sitting in a room somewhere um, to be able to talk about this, but I guess that's the, the good aspect of technology is that we probably couldn't all make it to the same room at the same point in time. So this is a way around that. And it's really exciting to have uh, people from all over the country to, uh, being involved today in this chat. So um, I wanted to just start by saying thank you, Andrew, for introducing me. Um, I, as he said, I've been studying urban districts for nearly 20 years and focusing on mostly large and mid-sized urban districts across the country. My background is in education and policy and leadership. And so when I've been bringing um, my research to these different contexts, I've been focusing on a lot of aspects of reform and improvement generally. But in, in the last 10 years or so, I've become really much more focused on what's going on in the lowest performing schools and districts as they try to improve under accountability policy sanctions. Although this research will, um, will inform the conversation today, I think you'll find that the ideas that I discuss are relevant in all school and district contexts. So one thing I just want to say a little caveat is that um, today I'm going to talk less about specific, uh, specific types of data because so much of this is, is context driven. But what I'm going to talk more about is the process of organizational learning, which can facilitate access to and use of data and bring about improvement. All right. So today I'm going to start by talking about organizational learning, clarifying and defining what that is. Next, I'm going to turn to some of my social network analysis maps, as Andrew mentioned, from my work to highlight some of the challenges in urban schools and districts. And I'm going to end with five takeaways. And I hope that the ideas that I share spark something in your own work that you'll be able to use. Um, I've built in a few stopping points where I'm going to ask you to take a poll as a sort of check-in to make this a bit more interactive than your typical webinar. I think that um, you know I'll just imagine that you're all nodding your heads along with me, but just in case you're not, of course, as they mentioned in the chat on the left, um, you can raise issues or questions along the way, particularly if there's something that I need to clarify. Okay, so. Let's start with what is organizational learning? And I realize that some of you may already have a clear understanding of organizational learning. So if that's the case, bear with me for a moment. But for those of you who are less familiar or feel like this term is thrown around um, and, doesn't, and isn't always clarified, I think it'll allow us through this discussion to bring the same lens to the social network maps later in the webinar. So the first thing is that my my work draws upon the work of a number of organizational scholars that you may be familiar with, including Argyris and Schoen and March, Huber, Levitt, Feil, Lyles, and others. And an important starting point of thinking about organizational learning is that it focuses less on the entity of the organization and more on the active process of organizing, focusing on the cognitive process of group interactions and the joint construction of problem and solutions in the processing of knowledge. So what I'm going to talk about today um, around organizational learning has to do with these four steps that you can consider phases in this process. Although it's easier to talk about them as steps or phases, in reality this is a little bit more fluid and interactive. And one thing that is important, so if we go through these, I'll go through each of these in more detail. So diagnosing problems, searching for solutions, implementing strategies, and reflecting, revisiting, and evaluating. All of these steps, as I'm going to talk about, involve accessing, interpreting, and using data. And I just should clarify that when I'm talking about data here, I'm not just talking about student performance data, but data much more broadly defined. So these phases, as I'm going to talk about, are really important um, based in this literature on organizational learning to bring about both strategic and sustainable change. 
and how data fits in is actually in all of these different steps, as I'll show you. Okay, so let's turn to the first step, diagnosing the problem. Most often the solutions to low, performing, low performance in schools and districts is decided without a clear understanding of what the problem is. People focus on the symptoms and not the root causes. And I'm going to give you an example in a moment to show you what I mean by that. But with a superficial understanding of data and a narrow examination of this, what happens is there's a, an idea of how to move forward without a clear understanding. And that ends, you, ends to the situation of putting the cart before the horse. So what's really critical, and this seems so obvious, but it comes up every time in every school and district we're in, that um, it, it takes a lot more deeper understanding of what's going on. And if you don't have that uh, stronger and deeper understanding, you likely will have the wrong solution, and then you, will have, you won't be able to see the improvements. School improvement plans sometimes provide an opportunity for this kind of uh, deeper analysis of the problem and diagnosis, but often these are not uh, done in an authentic way. And they rarely focus on the root cause. In fact, I did an analysis a few years ago of, of all the re restructuring plans in a district, and only one of them had even one bit of information about a root cause. It was all about the symptoms, so that our performance is low in a certain area, but not why it was low. And data is so critical here um, to use, not just a hunch, but really looking at how are you going to support that this is the problem, this is the reason why. So let me just give you an example that's sort of a simple example, but I think it helps to bring some of these things to light. It's an actual example from research I have going on right now. So um, there's leaders of a voluntary choice program in a group that I'm working with here, and they were concerned that parents were not attending the program's mandatory meetings. They were worried because of the vast research that indicates a link between parent involvement and student achievement. And the program requires that as part of participation, all parents with students in the program attend these mandatory meetings. And so they, based on this concern, they looked at the attendance records and found the number of parents that, who had not completed the requirements. So now I'm going to turn to a poll, the first poll, to see if you're all understanding what I'm trying to say about diagnosing the problem. Did these leaders use data to identify the root cause of this problem? I'll just give you a minute to click your box or circle. <laughs> So the question is, as they were diagnosing this problem, did these leaders use data to identify the root cause? I'll just give you another minute in case you're having any trouble uh, entering your views. Okay, great. So some of you are still entering, and let's just talk for a minute as you do. Just a reminder that when, the, when they were trying, trying to understand this problem, they looked at attendance data. So they did look at data. They did use data. But the question was whether they identified the root cause. And so uh, the issue is that they weren't ever understanding why parents why parents were not attending mandatory meetings. They know they're coming, but they don't know why. And they need to dig dip deeper to find out which parents or which meetings. And they could use other data that was available to look at trends. And they also need to ask questions of these data and consider what data that they don't have that would better help them understand the situation and then collect that too. In this case, for example, asking parents through a survey or interviews might uncover additional information that could inform their understanding of the problem. So, and just to clarify that there was data involved, but the root cause was never um, identified in this case. Now we'll go back to the other slides. Okay, so the next step after diagnosing the problem is searching for solutions. 
And there are two types of search that go on. The first exploitation involves looking internally for solutions to the problem. So in this case, they're working on building ideas from inside the organization. And this is associated with refinement. You're taking things that you already know and refining those practices or policies. And it's associated with short-term improvement as well. The challenge is that you can't see the additional options that are out there. And often this leads, therefore, to the status quo. So in the little figure to the right of the slide, you'll see a lot of colored people in circles. And so what this means, exploitation would be all of the blue people turning to each other inside their organization after they've diagnosed the problem and trying to figure out what the solutions would be. So the other way of thinking about search is to think about exploration. This involves looking externally for sol solutions to the problem. And this sometimes helps us get out from under the constraints we put on our thinking. So now you're speaking strategies from outside the organization. And this is associated with experimentation, innovation, and long-term improvement. The challenge here, though, is that you might have a solution that people within the organization don't have the beliefs and capacity that are aligned to it. Now, in this case, then, if you go back to the picture, uh, the figure on the right, it would be as if all of the blue people started going to the reds and the oranges and the greens and the yellows, and now they're trying to see what solutions they would bring to the same problem. Now, March talks about how both exploitation and exploration are needed in the search for solutions. In both cases, importantly, communication, con connectedness, and trust are required. Now, I'm going to turn back to the parent involvement example. What happened next in this case of search was the leaders identified a solution to the problem of parents not attending mandatory meetings and decided to do two things. They wanted to have the consequences for not attending these meetings be more clearly delineated and have them be enforced. So first they decided to reiterate the agreement of participation in the program through a letter to all parents. One consequence that was already written in the policy manual is that the child keeper could be removed from the program. And they wanted to add additional consequences of having the parent have to do additional volunteer work to make up for this time. The leaders met with the governing body of the program to run their solutions by them, and a decision was made to slightly alter the intermediary consequences and move forward with the solution. Okay, let's get everybody involved again. So now we're going to switch again to the poll. And if you um, could, could add your thoughts on whether, now that I've given you the information about exploitation ex and exploration, I'd like you to put in your thoughts of whether, which one were they, which type of search did these leaders use? And I'll just give you a moment so that everybody can um, put in their thoughts. And this helps me to see um, where there's less, um, where maybe I'm being less clear. And so I can help to explain some of these things a little bit more if you add your thoughts. I'll just give a little bit more time. Okay, it looks like we're slowing down a little. This is really fun. I, c I wish I could do this all the time and get everyone's opinions at once. Okay, so mostly um, people responded, you can see, that it was exploitation that was going on. And, that, and that's actually what it was. They were exploiting the ideas that they already had within their organization. And there might have been a little confusing because they did go to the governing board, but the governing board was still within the organization. And so the paradigm of thinking was within the group that existed versus going outside to other um, individuals and organizations. Um, I'm happy to see that m very few people put that they didn't know, and that's good. Um, and so I'll just reiterate for those of you who didn't, that when you're exploiting ideas from inside, you're relying on the kinds of things that you've been doing and usually refining those practices. 
you can think about it as sort of turning to the people that you usually talk to. When you're exploring instead, you're searching outside of your normal group of people that you're talking to. And so if you think about this in an organizational context, it would be as if the district was trying to solve a problem district-wide, and instead of continuing to meet with the same people in the district, they might go to um, higher education or other districts or the alliance or some other group. Um, now, the balance, the tricky part is sort of balancing those two things to continue to move forward and not remain sort of stuck in the way that you've always been doing things. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. So now after searching for solutions, the problem's been diagnosed, the solution has been identified, it's time to implement the strategies. And the main thing here is to keep the problem and root cause front and center. And as I'm sure those of you who, in, who are in schools and districts know, it's really hard to keep moving forward on one particular course of action because of the competing tensions that you always face. And so trying to um, ensure that everything is moving forward and doesn't get derailed because of some other uh, unanticipated situation, you want to make sure so that you can have the solution again, the strategy meeting the original root cause of the problem. Now, as I talked about a moment ago, when exploration is happening, you've now got new ideas and practices, so you have to identify whether there's a need to build the internal capacity to implement these. And one of the other key things is, is building and collecting data as part of implementation. And now I'm going to go back to the, the parent involvement problem. So in this case, we talked about how they exploited the knowledge inside the organization. So there was not a concern about building internal capacity. They were just refining what they were already doing around the articulation and implementation of consequences for parents. These leaders did not collect additional data as part of this process, which would have been a perfect opportunity to do so. But instead, they would rely again on attendance records across across all of the meetings as, the, as they're really the only set of data that they were relying upon to understand this and move forward. Okay, now the last step is revisiting, reflecting, and reevaluating. Keep in mind that um, there's two aspects of, or two series of actions, what you say and what you do. So the first is a spouse theory is what you say or believe or your intention around a certain strategy or, or reform. The second is your theory and use or what your actions suggest or what you actually do. So for example, if your school mission is to have all children grow and learn, but your resources are only allocated towards supports for certain achievement levels, that's a gap between your espouse theory and your theory and use. Now this is a really critical step in the organizational learning process. You don't just see what happens or what the outcome was of your strategy, but you continue the process of learning. And one of the most important things is, this is the hardest part, is trying to figure out, or, or I guess first figuring out and challenging the underlying assumptions and beliefs. This is the part that separates out the organizations that are learning from those that are not. In reality, this could come at the diagnosis stage, but should happen again at this point. It's so important to be critical in trying to understand what assumptions were being made and how these shaped both the diagnosis and the search for solutions. But this step requires trust, and it can't be linked to any type of evaluation procedures, making it extremely difficult in the current policy context. So back to the example. So the leaders in my example did not do this step, and as a result, they did not learn. And any fluctuation in meeting attendance, for example, if they had an increase in attendance, it would all be a short-term response. What they could have done here, though, was question the assumptions they were making about parents. There was a strong undercurrent that parents didn't care enough because they knew about the meetings and didn't attend. Putting pressure on them was therefore meant to increase their motivation towards meeting attendance. However, if they had questioned their assumptions and looked at additional data, they might have found a completely different reason parents weren't attending. It may have been a simple thing like the time of the meetings, or it may have been a deeper reason, like parents in the program did not feel vested in the program, or did they did not see themselves as partners, or they did not value the meeting topics, or a number of other potential reasons why they didn't come. Now the issue is we don't know which one of them this is until we dig deeper into the data. 
additional analyses around the administrative records that they had or additional data that they could have collected could have provided evidence of one or more of these reasons and led to changes in, in their assumptions, in their norms, in their policies, and in their practices. Okay. So given the importance of challenging assumptions to organizational learning, I just wanted to have a reminder about ways to do this. So these are different strategies. Developing a critical stance, coming up with what you think is the root cause, and then identifying a list of alternative, alternative explanations, including more voices and perspectives, including those outside of your organization. Analyzing different types of data, Providing a supportive environment where people are allowed to question why you do the things you do, and of course, all of the above. So now that you have a sense of the process of organizational learning, let's go a step further. Scholars, are, they divide this learning process into what they call single and double loop learning. Single loop learning is like turning on a thermostat if you feel cold in your house. It involves limited questioning and choosing what is most known and sticking with your normal paradigm paradigm. So if I'm cold, I must need to turn the heat up, rather than consider that I, there might be something else going on. Maybe I have low blood sugar. Maybe I left a window open. In this case, information, superficial, limited information quickly leads to action. Now, this is a problem right now, especially with the data use tension, because data, we can have data that we respond to quickly and superficially, and that might lead to our first response, and that is a limited response. So single loop learning discourages inquiry. It treats a view as obviously correct. It relies on limited data. It's self-reinforcing, acting against long-term interests. It's less risky. And maybe most important, it involves control. It, it involves usually the gatekeeping of ideas, so what ideas are able to move forward. But it also involves the protection of the self, because asking those other harder questions can make you feel vulnerable or in incompetent. And this is especially critical right now in the policy context we have. OK, but on the other hand, double loop learning is a more thorough process. It's much less common. It requires all of the things that we've been talking about already, modification of underlying norms and policies and objectives good quality data from multiple sources, more voices and perspectives at the table, and allowing them to question what's going on, broader participation in the design and implementation of action. This stage involves creativity, reflection, and scrutinization. And it encourages the surfacing of conflicting views. Now, I don't want to um, mislead you. You can't have everyone at the table. You wouldn't be able to get anything done. But it's really being sure that you're not just including the same voices and that you can extend to other voices that do not tend to be involved. Because it's amazing the different kind of conversation you'll have when you have people who haven't been sitting and thinking about it before. They give different perspectives and raise this different questions. And in having that conversation, you're all learning more by these various perspectives coming to the table. Now, it has to become embedded, or individuals will have learned, but the organiza organization won't. And one more thing on double loop learning, it's like walking around the block twice. The first time you pay attention to certain things, but the second time around, it's a whole different thing. You're able to notice more, and you notice things in a, mo in a more nuanced way. Now, the big problem here is that the more things are at stake, the more we resort to single loop learning. It's efficient, it's timely, and it provides a narrow range of discussion and solutions. But these are exactly the times and places that we need double loop learning to occur. OK, now we're going to turn to another poll. When considering school and district leaders, where do you see the greatest difficulty in moving schools and districts to become learning organizations? There's no right answer here, but I think that your perspectives will help to see in how this can be different in different contexts. And I'm just going to give you a few minutes to Take out the poll, take the poll so that we can see all your votes. So 
So again, these four stages each involve data. And the whole process is your process of learning as a school or a district. And the challenge is that each, well, each of these is challenging in its own way. And I think that um, the participants right now are leaning towards the most challenging being reflecting, revisiting, and evaluating. And I would agree that's a very big challenge. And in fact, like I said, this is such an uncommon step in terms of especially the questioning of assumptions and why you do the things you do. <clears throat> and as I said, there's no right answer. Unfortunately, for this process, all of these are difficult stages. And so you can see where, you know, just in the kinds of things that have to happen in each step along the way, um, things can, can, can make, can have make more difficulty in each of these process, steps of the process. And I would agree to, with, the, um, with everyone's votes that probably diagnosing and reflecting those first and last steps are the most difficult because they shape the way you think about what's going on. Okay, let's go back to the slides. So if you were to walk away today and consider what this all means for school and district leaders, I would summarize in a few ways. Data is important to all stages of the learning process. And the superficial use of data will not help with answers because you usually remain within the old paradigm. That's the single loop learning I was talking about. And the questioning of assumptions requires trust, multiple voices, and scrutiny. Now, this is where in the current accountability policy context, leaders seem to have the most difficulty. Creating a true learning community requires learning from each other, co-interpreting different types of data, and creative responses to complex problems. It doesn't include quick fixes. So now I'm going to shift to my own research and some social network maps that I think do a nice job of highlighting some of the critical challenges schools and districts face in bringing about improvement. This research is based on a number of studies, and they're mostly funded by W.T. Grant and Spencer Foundations. And I've been working collaborative, collaboratively with my colleague, Alan Daly, in San Diego. And through these studies, we've, got multiple, we've been using multiple methods. So there's qualitative data, there's quantitative survey data, and there's social network data. We've been trying to understand things at multiple levels, so within schools and within central offices and across the whole district. And we have multiple years of data. So it's lo they're longitudinal designs following change processes over time. And this is a really unique set of data that has all of these different types of data at different levels over time to understanding organizational learning and improvement. Now, um, I have a list here of some publications that I think, if in case you're interested in digging in after the webinar is over, um, these are some recent publications that have to do with um, the social network analyses that I'll be talking about, as well as leadership and change in underperforming systems. And here are some more of those. Okay. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with social network maps, let me orient you as to what you'll see in the next few, few slides. So social networks are trying to understand the underlying set of connections in an organization. And the um, networks involve nodes, which are, really, which are just individuals in the network. Those are the people. And in the network maps, instead of looking like people, <laughs> they look like little dots or squares. And in the research that I've been doing, we've, um, ha we have bounded networks, which in, there's different reasons why you might do bounded or unbounded. <clears throat> but for these purposes, we use bounded networks because they help us to understand the organization itself. And as you'll see in the maps, or if you've ever seen these uh, maps before, you'll know that you can do different types of analyses, and you can use different colors and shapes as attributes, and they can help you understand things differently as you look at your data. Also, the ties are directional. And what that means, it's not on this little figure, it doesn't show that, but on the maps you'll see that there are arrows which show either one-way ties, or if the arrows go both ways, then there are reciprocal ties. And overall, the network structure are the ties among members of the organization. So I'm going to talk about all of these things as we go through the maps. As you remember, probably, uh, connectedness was critical to organizational learning. But in many districts, especially low-performing districts, this is very limited. So this network that you're looking at is 
um, from our research, and it's a it's called a best practices network. So it involves who do you turn to for best practices, and this is an entire district. So it's bounded. So everyone who is in a in a as a director or above in the central office, and all of the principals are included in this map. And as I mentioned before, that you can use colors to help understand things. So the um, blue colors are principals, and the red colors are central office. Now, again, this is a bounded network, because when we asked people to, to in the survey, who did they connect to, we included a list of all the names. That's how we bounded it. And we actually have a place separately where we ask about other people they go to out outside of their organization. Um, but for this, I'm just talking about the bounded part, which is everyone who is sort of on the list that they ask about ends up being in the network. And this is the organization of what we call district leaders. So in this case, the, again, the blues and the reds are the different positions, principals in central office. And on the left-hand side, what you'll see are a whole bunch of dots. And those are people that are not connected into the network at all. We call them isolates. And so these are, you'll see, uh, more principals in central office, but some of each, that are not connected to anyone around best practices, and nobody connects to them around best practices. Also, the direction of ties might be hard to see, but the, you'll see the arrows um, mostly go one way. And so they, they're not recipro reciprocal ties. They're one-way ties around best practices. <clears throat> Overall, so now that you have a sense of what this picture is showing of all these individuals, you can see that there's, it's a very sparse network. There's not very much connection around best practices in this district. There's especially low connection among principals, the blue dots. But there's also a low connection between principals and central office. Now this one is just principals. It's the same uh, it's the same network, but I've removed central office now. And I think this helps to show even more how, re how reciprocal connections are rare. So again, this, this is every person is represented by either a circle or square, <clears throat> excuse me, a circle or square. And the square are principles of low performing schools. Now you have more isolates on the left because actually some people were connected to central office. So we take them out of the picture, it shows more clearly just how sparse this network of principles is. Now you also see there are some small groups that are um, connected, very small clusters of people that connect to each other but to nobody else. <clears throat> And m maybe most important to this is besides the fact that reciprocal, reciprocal connections are so rare, is the fact that low performing schools are very isolated in this district. So on the left hand side you'll see a lot of squares. And the few squares that are actually in the network um, <clears throat> are connected either to just one other school, and often that other school is a low performing school. Now the size of these um, nodes, I should mention that they're sized by centrality. And so let me go back and show you on this last side because it shows it a little more clearly. When the, when the slides are bigger, they mean that they are more central in the network. And so in this overall network, the reds, you can see central office are a bit more central, which just means that more people go to them. So they're sized to help that kind of jump out at you and you can see that more clearly. Now in this case, they're, they look bigger, but really it's just because the connections are so sparse. So you look bigger if you just have two or three people going to you. So it's not as, um, it's not as informative in this as it has been in other cases. Okay, so now we're going to go to a poll. And before we do, I just want you to take another look at this and see how you, what you notice about the connectedness among principles and the reciprocal ties that exist. And so what I want to show you is that there are, there's the, given the current connections, here let's see, given the current connections in slide 25, which principal has the greatest potential to help this district become a learning organization if their ties were reciprocated? So let me go back. 
because it might be really hard to see. I'm going to help point out to you where these individuals are that I was highlighting. So here you'll see is S18. Whoops, not there. There. <laughs> okay. Here is S21. And here is S33. So which principal has the greatest potential to help this district become a learning organization if their ties were reciprocated? I'll just give you all a moment to take a look at this. And maybe I should just walk through them again. So S18 is here. S21 is here, and S33 is here. OK. I'll give a few more, a little bit longer, in case you're starting to try to figure out which one you think it is. OK, I think the ideas have slowed down. So most of you notice that S33, right in the middle here, because they have so many ties out to other people, if this person had reciprocal ties, then they would have the biggest impact on the organization to make this a stronger learning organization, just in the fact that they already have so many of these connections that exist. Now this is, can be a little confusing just because there are, um, these ones are sized a little bit bigger because a few people go to them now and they also don't have reciprocal ties. But in the end, they have fewer ties. And so changing their ties to more reciprocal ties would not have had as big an effect on the overall organizational learning. OK. Now we're going to go to another slide. And this one will take a little bit more orienting you to this. Um, this is a different district. And what you see here are all, again, this is the entire set of district leaders. And what I mean by that are all the principals in the district and all of the central office staff that are directors or above. Now, what you're seeing here is that this district organizes principals into clusters. And so the clusters that you see are clusters that are colors. And those colors are principals. OK, so in the center are all of the central office staff, but they're in black. But because there's an area superintendent with each cluster, you'll see a black triangle associated with each of those color-coded areas. Now this network is around who do you go to for advice around data you use for improvement. And so I'll call this the data advice network. So in this network, you'll see that the central office is clustered. You know, it's, they're pretty tightly connected in there. But many of these clusters of principals do not seek out much advice around data from each other. So you can tell a little bit what I mean by this is that some of these, like, sorry, my, I have to figure out how my arrow goes. <laughs> the blue cluster, the pink cluster, they have a little bit more connectedness among principals. But over here, you'll see there's very little connectivity around advice around data of these paler green and paler blue. Now, what you'll also notice, again, is that there's a size here. And what, I'm, what is important about this is that one of the challenges is that a few individuals influence the flow of information and ideas district-wide. Now, before I had done sizes, um, in terms of how central they were in the network. But this one actually is sized a little bit differently. In this case, they're sized by um, whether the, how the, the language used is betweenness, or whether they're a broker of information in this district. And what that means if you're a broker or if you sit between is that you're connecting people who are otherwise disconnected. So you'll see here that the area superintendents in some districts, like here and here, are much bigger. And that means that they play a bigger broker role. 
Now, in other cases, though, you'll see they're either quite small, or there's another, a principal, who might play almost the same role as a broker of information. And again, this has to do with advice around data and how they're using data for school improvement. These area superintendents were actually set up to, to play this role of helping principals understand how to use data for improvement. So it's interesting to see how, as a district, this would show you that there's some problems in this overall rollout district-wide, because you have different things going on in different clusters of principals. You'll also see that there's, uh, again, not that much connection between principals and central office in many cases. And if, it, if there are connections, they're through the area superintendents sometimes, which, is, which would be appropriate, right? That wouldn't be a problem because they sit, sort of sit in this in-between role. But then there's the situations where there's nobody playing that broker role. And you can see, again, just how isolated clusters of, of individuals, of principals, can be around using data if they don't have that connectedness into the network. OK. Sorry, I switched too fast on you. But this, what I wanted to do was now see whether you could tell which cluster has an area superintendent who plays the biggest broker role and their zone also has the most connected principles to each other. So again, just to make sure we're all on the same page, this helps me a lot to see how you're understanding these different things. So I think that probably um, you need to see the map again. And I'm wondering if there's a way that we could do that, as people have asked. OK, great. So let me just go back on the slide. Thanks for letting me know that that would be helpful to do. So now, now that you can see it again, it's a little easier than going from your memory. Which cluster has an area superintendent, remember those are the triangles, who plays the biggest broker role and their zone has the most connected principles? And again, I'll give you a minute because I'm sure you're um, looking at the map and trying to see where you come out on this. This is one of the harder questions. And as you look at this, remember you're looking at two things. You're looking at both the broker role, which is the bigger size triangles, and you're looking at connectedness among principals within a cluster, which would be lines between principals, ties between principals within their cluster group. And I think since there's still some numbers coming in, I'll just give you a little longer for those of you who like to process it a little bit more. Now, while you're doing that too, I'll just remind you that one of the issues around having this kind of variability is that the whole organization is not learning if there's isolates in these groups like you see. OK, so most of you are coming in, and I agree with you, which is with royal blue. And the reason why is because the triangle is, the bi is one of the bigger triangles. And so you're right, for those of you who noticed that the gray triangle was big as a broker. Um, forest green was a little bit smaller, and yellow, those were a little bit smaller. But it would have to be a big broker role would be a, a larger sized triangle. So helping to understand this map, you'd see both that and also the connectedness within the group 
Um, so, so here there's less connectedness internally, although you do see some connectedness outside. And here there's a bit more. Now it's interesting because forest green is sort of an interesting group. What you see, and it might be hard to tell because the slide is not as big as probably it could be if it were on a big projector, um, but a lot of the lines, the, the ties here, are not within the group of principles in the forest green group, but they're actually outside. So, the, so they're going to other, other groups along the way versus going connecting inside. And so that's not, it's not to say that isn't connecting. It's just my question was about the connectedness inside and the brokering role. OK. So now I just want to turn to a different way of thinking about this. This is a school level slide to help you to understand, again, the limits or the, the limits on the flow of information and ideas within an organization. This is a research uh, network. It was, the question was about who brings research into the organization that you use in your practice. And these are two schools. So now I've moved away from the full district to just schools. School one and school two are both low performing schools. One of them has more staff than the other school two. So you see there's just a lot more dots. That, that just means that it's a bigger school in terms of the number of, um, of teachers and staff. Now, again, I've gone back to the sizing by centrality. So if you're a person who more people go to, then your size bigger. And the colors here, the yellow are classroom teachers, and the orange are administrators or others like a literacy coach, a vice principal, things like that. Now the black ones, you'll see just a few of those. Those people didn't, um, didn't respond on their position. But from what I know of these schools, they're most likely classroom teachers because of the numbers that we have in those categories. So what you see here is, again, those isolates on the side. The um, little dots, again, they're hard to tell the colors. It doesn't really matter right now, because what I'm trying to show you is just how many people are isolated from research in these schools. So this means when they're isolated, again, when they're on the left-hand side, it means they don't get any ideas from research from anyone in their school, and nobody gets any ideas from research from them. The other thing to notice is that um, there's just more ties in the, in the larger school. School one has some ties, but they're pretty sparse. And in fact, a lot of the ties that you see are radiating out from this person right here. So if that person, who sort of checked a lot of people, um, didn't get idea, you know, didn't 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 check all of those people about getting ideas from research from them, you would have a much different picture. Now, the main thing that I want you to t to walk away with here is that there's one person in each school that is really the key source of research. If that person leaves, then you don't have anything coming back into the school from research, or very limited, I should say. Because of course, there was some um, movement otherwise from that one person. But the majority was coming from one individual. And actually, that happened in school two. School two, this, in this case, was the, princ was the principal. And all you can see just how many people went to that person for ideas from research that they used in their practice. And that principal got moved to central office. And so you can kind of picture then what happens to the network, the movement of ideas and practices. You can just see how it would sort of separate everything out. And many would become isolates. And then there would just be so many fewer ties if you didn't have that, in, that individual who was bringing everything in. Now, that's not a bad thing. It's good that some ideas from research were making their way into the school. But, it, but having it be so centralized, you can see, just picture what the map would look like differently. All right, so let's just turn to one more poll to make sure that you're still with me. So which is more desirable in a learning organization? A more centralized research network, a more decentralized research network, or you don't know?
And I'll just give you a little bit of time again so that you can put in your thoughts. And again, this just helps me to see the kinds of things that you're thinking about. Unfortunately, I can't get everybody's responses back. It would be great if you could share your thoughts with me. But I'll just make some interpretation along the way as I talk about the poll. OK, so most of you are coming in, um, which, which is, I think, a really important point, which is that a decentralized research network means that there's more stability in having these kinds of ideas remain in the organization if someone were to leave. And also, it just gives more chance of different kinds of ideas getting in as well. Um, a more centralized research network is really a better kind of network if you're trying to control what's going through the organization. And so if there's really just one message to give, then that would be a more central network would be good. Now in these urban systems that I am usually studying, however, the, the, there's so much turnover. So these, these networks, having it be centralized, there's, there's a lot of um, risk involved in that for a number of reasons. But one is just because of the movement around. And so if that person was sort of the voice of research and they're moved or they leave, then you, you lose that. Um, it's really an issue that comes down to the decentralized research network tends to be more like what we were talking about before, where more ideas and perspectives are bringing things in. So you have more things at the table when you're trying to deal with these kind of complex problems that are happening in low-performing schools and urban contexts. OK, so now we'll go back to uh, the last set of network slides. <clears throat> and this, again, is back to um, the district level. And so I'll just remind you that the blue, the blue colored nodes are principals, and the reds are central office. This is some data that it's the same exact district from year one to year two. The exact same people are involved in these two slides. Um, the size I'm, I'm using here is, again, centrality. So if you're someone that more people go to, that you are sized bigger than the other nodes. And that helps just to visually kind of see who, who is sort of the go-to person for information or ideas or practices. Now this tie, what's really important to see here is that over time in this district, there was a change in the kind of work-related ties. This was expertise around your work. And this shows some significant change from year one to year two in terms of the connectedness of principals and central office. And so you can see here in the earlier, in the year one, principals were rarely connected to themselves and rarely connected to central office. So there were sort of these two separate connections going on, as you saw earlier. Um, and also that there's these isolates who are not connected in at all. Now by year two, you see that this, is, this has changed drastically, where there's much more connectivity around their work. And what that means is this, well, what happened in this district is that more structures were put into place. But it's not just about structures, you have to remember, because it's also about these underlying connections. So did people actually turn to each other, whether or not they felt like they had to go to that meeting? Were they getting ideas and practices from each other? So this is the kind of thing you can see that changed in this district from year one to year two. Now the problem is, is that in the same time period, the emotional ties, are, if you can think of trust as a, you know, effective ties like trust, are also going on in that same place. In any organization, you have both your work you're doing and you have your connectedness, your more personal connectedness to people. And what you can see here, and I'll just step back and let you look for a minute on year one. Let's start there. <clears throat> so this district had really a very big disconnect. So the blues went to the blues, and the reds went to the reds, but nobody really was turning to each other in terms of these kind of emotional and trusting ties. And there were a lot of isolates over here. Now what happened, though, is this in the same time, if you remember, that things seem to be getting better in terms of these kind of work-related connections, the sharing of ideas and practices and expertise. At the same time, things were getting worse in terms of the trust that was in this system. And, and what happens here is you can see that this 
just completely deteriorated. Um, and again, these are exactly the same people. There was some turnover in this time period, but they're not included in these slides. These are matched individuals. And so you can see what happened is everyone, most of these people became isolates. We're not connected in at all into this trust network. Now, the problem with that is that organizational learning, the literature is very clear on this, that you need these conditions for learning to occur. And so it's not just around data, but it's around trust and interpretation and connectedness and, and reciprocity and these things that you would be doing as you understand and interpret the data that allow you to move forward with your work. So trust really comes first, and it's hard to rebuild. And without trust, these other kinds of um, work-related ties and ideas and practices won't move forward and learning won't happen. OK. So why is this important? Well, there's continued pressures on schools and, in dis and districts and the educator within these to improve. And data has become higher quality and more widely available. I'm sure a lot, a lot of you out there are thinking there's so much data. Which, you know, which things do we look at? We have so much now. That's a very different story than even a few years ago, where data was more difficult to get your hands on. The problem is there's lots of reform, but little evidence of improvement. And so I hope that you're picking up my point here, which is that perhaps we're focusing too heavily on the technical aspect of data use without understanding the more process-oriented learning that makes complex change possible. So to summarize, if you remember across the social network maps you looked at, you saw a lack of ties among principals and between principals and central office staff. You saw centralized networks around research and limited connections around data. You saw rare instances of reciprocal ties which are needed for learning to occur. You saw a lack of connectedness between central office staff and principals, especially for the critical emotional types of ties or trust. And you saw an isolation of the lowest performing schools, meaning that new ideas and practices weren't making their way into these, resulting in refining of the same solutions that have been used before. These maps are really useful in providing visual images of what's really going on and why improvement's so rare. Now, one thing I haven't talked about as much, though, is that it's critical to understand the limited improvement that exists has to do with high turnover in these schools and districts. When you consider the intensive double loop learning process and then consider how at each step of the process the people are changing and a sort of starting over occurs, it becomes more clear why this is so difficult. In one of our low performing schools, 30% of the teachers change over each year. And in these districts, we've had 50% of the staff turnover directors and above. And so just that kind of starting fresh again and again underscores the problem of all those steps in the process that you were noting before that can be challenging for school and district leaders. You can have all the data in the world, but understanding how to interpret and use it remains one of the biggest challenges in urban school districts, because it requires this kind of process-oriented learning. OK. Now, I like to go to my five takeaways. And these are, I think, the main things that when you were to walk away today or if you were to tell someone about what you learned today, I'm hoping that they resonate with you. The first is to consider multiple angles, issues, and types of data when solving a problem. The second is to question what the cause is, the why of the problem, and be critical of all the assumptions you're making along the way. The third is don't get stuck inside. Search for ideas outside your organization, the school, or the district. And then make sure you have the internal capacity to implement these new solutions. The organizational learning and change is complex. That's important. And also, that involves both the heart and the head. So you can't just be starting to work harder around this technical aspect of reform, but the emotional aspect and the sharing of ideas and practices, that taking a risk really requires a lot of trust. And last is to walk around the block twice. I think that, it, you know, if nothing else, if you can think about how, instead of just saying you, you're done when you find out the results out of that strategy, but to kind of question the assumptions and move around and do it again, I think it would open up a whole new set of learning for your organization. Now, some of you out there are um, involved in, they're at the level of state and federal policy. And so you know, one thing is to think about how, what's, what's the learning at that level? Since my background is policy, I'm always thinking about that too. The good news, I guess, is that accountability policy and data-driven instruction movements have prompted much more access to and discussion about data. 
But accountability policies must be more focused on building the capacity of leaders to interpret and co-construct knowledge. More partnerships across researchers and practitioners could facilitate a different approach to data interpretation and use. The weak internal connections and high levels of distrust are actually exacerbated by the pressures of accountability policy, policy sanctions. And so trying to figure out how to really move, and not just say we're moving, from compliance-oriented responses to capacity building systems is critical. There's also this issue of leadership that's really critical to this whole thing. I mean, strengthening the leadership training of principals and central office leaders, particularly those under pressure, is so important so they're able to develop the supportive and trusting cultures necessary for organizational learning. There's really a lack of attention to the preparation and development of leaders throughout the system. And that relates to the limited um, capacity for moving data and evidence throughout. And so this is some of the variability that you saw in that one slide around the, the brokers, the triangles, and, and how it looks so different depending on the cluster you were in, what kind of connectedness there was. And that's limiting because if that's your resource, if that's your, your outlet for information, then you might be um, hindered in your ability to move forward. And the district overall is limited. Also, um, in terms of policy, there's, there's really, or I guess maybe not policy, but practices as you're working with um, school and district leaders, is requiring the root cause to, cause to be identified as part of these um, reform processes and questioning the assumptions to change norms, policies, and practices, and helping them to understand when superficial diagnoses are occurring and how these can lead to the wrong solutions. Okay, so if you are desiring to find out more about my research and publications, here are a couple of links that you can access. And they have a number of these different um, papers uh, accessible to you. Or um, you're welcome to also contact me. Here's my contact in information included. So thank you very much. Well, that was, uh, this is Anthony Petrosino, and I'm a researcher for the RHEL. That was a wonderful presentation. I certainly learned a lot. I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of folks. And now we want to move to um, taking some questions from the it's pretty active chat and uh, from some of the questions that have come in. Some of them are clarification questions. Uh, uh, Kara, and I'll, I'll just um, ask you to maybe clarify a point or two that, that came in on the chat. Um, can you clarify how, and this, this was said, I think, when you were making your transition to the networking uh, research, can you clarify how individuals learn but organizations don't? Sure. Um, and this gets back to what I meant about collective change. So when you're thinking about, for example, the school organization and school improvement, you might have a number of teachers in that school who have um, an understanding of new ideas and practices and are, you know, can see sort of the way um, you could conquer problems and diagnose and things like that. But if you don't have the group coming together around that, the organizational ne will never learn. You'll just have individuals in that organization who sort of understand these, these processes and, and may have a better sense of the kinds of strategies to do, but without sort of that um, critical mass, the organization itself won't move forward. Great. Thanks, Kara. And, and, and similar to that, uh, a question came in about embedded, the concept of embedded, embedded, embeddedness, uh, if you could clarify that. Sure. I think that um, you know this becomes more thinking about the process of data use and this organizational learning process I was discussing, those phases, really becoming part of the way you work, um, not becoming sort of an add-on. And I think that's sometimes what I've seen, the, just the school improvement plan process. That becomes sort of an add-on. Oh, we have to get that done because we have to turn it in. It's not really an authentic learning process. And that's what I mean by having it be embedded. So it's you know, a part of how the group is coming together at the school or district level and really thinking about diagnosing the problem, you know, uh, figuring out the solutions, and working their way through that and questioning the assumptions and all of that, and not just doing it because they're complying with some report that they have to get into someone else. Great, thank you for that. That's a great clarification there. Uh, I'm going to move to some of the substantive questions that have come in, as we we certainly got a number a number of those uh, in the chat. And I thank all the participants who 
for their uh, excellent questions. Going back to your uh, parent participation example, yes, and of course they didn't have a root cause because they uh, the, the data were not were not collected. But one question that came in is: Is there a particular method for focusing on root causes and not symptoms? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think that a lot of this is sort of more um, taking a critical stance when you're looking at your data and I guess trying to figure out the why. So whenever you're seeing, I mean, for in this case, for example, they, they sort of got stuck on the the symptom, which is that people weren't coming, but they never got to the why. And so I guess if you keep thinking, well, I don't really know why they're not coming, then that would be that would alert you to the fact that you would need to dig a little deeper. And one of the problems is is that we all do this. We all bring our hunches to the table. And so you know, even in this in this conversation, there were some different hunches raised about why it was. But you'd have to really find out by using data you know, to be able to see what was going on. So one of the things, just in this example again, is that just looking at some trend data might have helped to get, you know, get a little bit deeper into understanding this. Was this always the case every year? Was it that certain um, meetings were less attended? You know, some of the things that they actually already had in their administrative records they could have been looking at a little more closely and closely and critically. And then of course, you know, if you are, are able to, I think in this case it would have really been suitable to actually ask some questions about it of the people who weren't coming. But again, as I said, now that's um, often a concern and why people sometimes stay in this single loop learning process because it makes you more vulnerable. It's raising the question of why could be that something you're doing isn't working. And so that makes it a little bit more challenging for people. And so I think that this, you know, I guess the main answer would be keep asking why, but also keep asking why and looking at different data and having more people looking at the data will also raise more questions. <coughs> One, one, one question that's coming is sort of like, what's the bottom line of this? And, and the question is, what's the evidence that low-performing schools improve when there's a process-oriented learning, process -oriented learning visible through a social network analysis? Well, I think the important, it's a very good question. And the important thing is that the, we do have some evidence in the research that I've been doing that there is more improvement in the more connected places. But there's also, um, you know, a sort of intuitive thing that you could think about that if the idea, for example, is to improve low and performing schools and no ideas and practices are getting into those schools, then they are for, sort of forced to be stuck in the single loop spot because all they have are sort of the things that they know to do again and again. So part of it is from the research that, um, that I've been doing where we can show some of the differences in places that actually have been more successful with their low performing schools, either at the district level or, or internally at the school. But then some of this is also just thinking thinking about how do, we, how do we expect that things will change when there's no new ideas and new practices moving around the system. Well, I want to thank all the questions that are coming in. Some we may not be able to get to, and we'll try to follow up with a written response. But uh, another question that's come in is, do you recommend that schools use social network analysis or merely apply the principles derived from it? Ah, good question. Um, I think that it's difficult for schools to do for schools and districts to kind of do to I'm sorry to do this kind of social network analysis on their own because of the um, requirement of confidentiality around who's connecting with with who, and I think that the problem they would find, I would anticipate, is that people would be less likely to kind of share who they're turning to or who they're not turning to because of concerns around an evaluative process that might take place, especially in urban systems. Now this comes up sometimes for us even as researchers because uh, there are questions around, you know, will we share this information and are our jobs at risk because of filling this out? And of course, you know, as researchers we have these kinds of things in place to ensure that uh, their, that their confidentiality will be retained. But I think it's the, and I can't remember if it was the latter or the former <laughs> of the question, but I think it's a little bit more of understanding as a system how to, make, how to make sure that you are doing the kinds of things to make sure there aren't isolates, for example. So kind of applying this kind of learning to your own organizations would help to make sure that ideas and practices are moving. So I think that there's ways that you could apply some of the learning from, from this research 
to your own context, but it would be probably more difficult to actually do the steps on your own without having concerns around evaluation. Understood. And a follow-up follow question to that is, do you have any idea how this process can be taken from the state level to the local level? Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I guess I think the question is then, or maybe, do, or am I interpreting right? Do you mean that, like, how would the state then understand this in terms of working with low performing schools and districts? Is that right? Right. I think it would be by really just um, having a better sense of what needs to happen within those schools and districts. And so, you know, <clears throat> one of the pro and also learning, <laughs> one of the problems, of course, is if the state were then to go to these contexts, they might not have an understanding um, of what's going on. So it would be having more connectedness across levels there, too. So maybe the state is would be making some assumptions about what might be happening, whereas if they could find out you know, from the local level, that might clear things up. But in general, I think that you could take these learnings if, say, you're a state person working with local districts and try to see if you can kind of help them through this process. I think that a key thing would be, I mean, again, I said it's a little messier than just these like four separate, you know, steps, but it does help, I think, to kind of think through with state and district, I'm sorry, with district and school leaders as they're moving, you know, as they're trying to figure out what's going on and improve, have they, you know, have they kind of walking through, have they diagnosed the problem? Has it a superficial diagnosis? Can they tell you the why? And then going through all of those things, where did they get the solutions? Have they, do they have the capacity inside? And so I think you could kind of take the steps, those four steps, and really use them in working with local schools and local districts if you're someone coming from the state. But one, one question that came up as well as you were speaking, Karen, in, in the beginning about organizational learning, is it always generated by problems? It seems like that's the, the crux, or is organizational learning take, can take place outside of sort of consideration of problems? Oh, that's a good question, too. I mean, I think that I would see it as organizational learning would probably, I mean, I would see it more as like a continuous improvement model. And so, I mean, oftentimes, because I'm mostly focused on low performing schools and districts, there is a problem that they're trying to, you know, solve to move forward. But I think that learning in general is just around always trying to kind of address, you know, address something that you might do better. And so it might be that you don't see it as much as a problem, but as, you know, a strategy for improvement. I think that might just be a little bit of, um, you know, linguistics or terminology because the learning process, I think, can happen even if, for example, you're not a low-performing school that's under sanctions. Well, that, that's just terrific. Uh, uh, Karen, thank you for, for being patient with me as I, as I fielded these questions. And there's certainly a lot yeah, more sure. out there and comments as well, but we're not going to be able to get to all of them right now, but we might be able to, or we certainly will follow up uh, later. Right now we want to turn it over to Andrew, and he's going to introduce, and I want to thank you again, Kara, for your excellent presentation, and, and uh, now we want to uh, turn it over to Andrew, who's going to introduce our, our next speaker. So thank you, thank you, Anthony. Before I do that, I want to mention that uh, our ultimate sponsor, the U.S. Department of Education, as well as the Regional Education Lab, wants your feedback on today's webinar uh, before you leave. So please do take the participants survey, and you can access that right at the bottom of the uh, <coughs> your screen uh, uh, before you before you leave here. Now I want to introduce Susan Yarm, who uh, will respond to Kara's uh, presentation and describe some of the things that they do in her district to create a systemic approach to um, use of data. Susan Yarm is Director of Research Assessment and Accountability in the New, Roche New Rochelle, New York City School District. She's also a member of the core planning group of our Regional Educational Lab, Urban School Improvement Alliance. And as a member of that group, Susan has learned a reputation for being both brief and very insightful. She consistently brings her extensive experience in using a systemic approach to working with data to inform instruction to our discussions. We're very pleased she's been able to take time in her busy schedule to contribute to our presentation today. So Susan, I'm going to turn over to you. Thank you, Andrew. I want to thank Kara for her thoughtful presentation today. And I think that those of us who are practitioners on the call may be wondering 
So how do we build and increase the flow of organizational learning to facilitate the use of data? And I want to share what our district is learning as we implement a data-wise improvement process, similar to Kara's description today, and how our district is now becoming a learning organization that embodies a culture of data use. And like the schools that Kara researched, our district is no stranger to the external demands of making adequate yearly progress under NCLB. As you can see here, our lovely campus of our New Rochelle High School, the City School District of New Rochelle is a vibrant urban suburban district with nearly 11,000 students only 15 miles north from Manhattan. And while all our schools are making AYP and we're in good standing, the district still wanted to strengthen a culture of data use in schools and buffer future external demands, which led to the adoption of the data-wise improvement process in 2011. The appealing promise of this process was that it would enable schools to become a coherent learning organization capable of leading continuous improvement while also distributing leadership. And this was a really important point that I think Carol was emphasizing in her network research. And that's often the case that central office administrators or principals are often the nexus for data in most of their districts undergoing accountability pressure. And information often resides with just a few individuals, which limits the opportunity for the entire organization to grow, advance, and be a part of the continuous school improvement process. So over the last two years, with the expertise of an external consulting firm, Education Direction, the district offered full-day professional development work workshops with coaching sessions throughout the year for all 10 schools. And the crux of the data-wise improvement process was to help us organize the work of instructional improvement around a process that had specific, manageable steps that also helped educators build confidence and skills in, the data, in using data. Uh, these sessions helped schools learn from assessments results and then inquire and act on what they had learned. So in our district, we created data teams that were comprising of teachers, administrators, and these teachers were not only content or subject teachers. Sometimes they were PE teachers. Sometimes they were art teachers. It was a very inclusive group of individuals that actually built the data teams for their school. And so what the data-wise improvement process did in our schools was it provided an opportunity for teachers and administrators to work side by side, not only on how to build their skills on the collection and analysis data, but really on how to be an effective team that led the improvement work in their buildings. Data teams also learned how to give high quality professional de development for their faculty meetings, and they also learned how to develop progress monitoring tools and implement peer observations as a process for instructional improvement. So, you know, I want to really emphasize this point that I think uh, Carol was making, was that we often focus on building the human capital. And in this process, we were. We were extremely invested in building the human capital of individuals so that they would increase in their competencies on how to interpret short, medium, long-term data. But reciprocally, we also help schools develop social capital where the members of the data team strengthen their relationships as they worked in teams to develop a plan and process to implement at their schools. So these workshops gave them an avenue to collaborate and synergize their collective efforts so that a co-construction of knowledge and thoughtful discussions had occurred so that they could come back and turnkey these trainings at their schools. And once back at the building, the data teams continued to build capacity in their schools. They scheduled time to meet consistently, regularly, to go through the steps in the process as a team. So this was the cyclical, iterative process that Carol was talking about. Um, I think she mentioned the double loop, where we constantly adjusted our actions after reviewing the data and worked with the entire staff to cycle back for further inquiry. And these teams became highly self-reflective and sought out ways to help their colleagues adjust their pedagogy while continuing to focus on their learner-centered problems. 
So as a result of this two-year implementation, which we will continue in the coming year, principals are reporting that by implementing the data-wise process, leadership is distributed, and teachers have more than one person in a school to help them utilize data and improve their practice. Someone asked earlier in the question, you know, what's your evidence? How do you know that improvement is happening? We've taken recent surveys from teachers on our data teams, and they, they feel empowered to lead the work. When we first started, we did not see that teachers felt confident to do this work, but over the last two years, we've seen a 20% increase in respondents saying that they feel like they are a resource and they feel empowered. And in a result, effective teaming has been the powerful outcome of this process, where there are norms of trust and collaboration established. And there is a real connectedness to one another as a result of implementing the process in their schools. Another thing that we have seen is that our schools are really becoming learning organizations that prepare, inquire, and act using protocols and structures from the data-wise improvement process. And the process is not only used for the work of the data team, but for multiple instructional teams in schools. So I think when you think about that network analysis that Kara did, for data information, there's actually network analysis within the school, within the teams that schools have. You know, you have RTI teams, you have pupil personnel services teams, you have special education teams, you have multiple teams that are working on improving student achievement. So what we learned was that the data-wise improvement process was replicable, that the opportunity to prepare the data, to inquire about why students are not improving in a certain area, and to be able to act was a very vital um, opportunity for schools to be able to have in their learning organization. And lastly, data teams believe that the process is leading to increased student learning and improvements in teacher practice. In fact, in a recent survey that we gave, almost 96% of the respondents feel that, and in this era focused on preparing students to be college and career ready, principals really cannot lead continuous school improvement alone. And so we're really pleased that data teams in our district report that there's a culture of collaboration and data use in their schools as a result of implementing the process. So, you know, I think that we go back to a, a, a statement that Kara made, and she said, perhaps we have focused too heavily on the technical aspect of data use without understanding the more process-oriented learning that makes complex change possible. And I just wanted to stress that the building of human capital and the social capital is a reciprocal process, one in which we have seen dynamic, powerful outcomes as a result. And to just really kind of confirm and affirm what Kara is saying in her research, that one done in isolation will not lead to a continuous cycle of school improvement. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, that was a, a fantastic summary of the work going on in New Rochelle and uh, the data-wise improvement process. And this is Dave Phillips. I'm a researcher with uh, the Rail Northeast and Islands as well. And uh, in our remaining time today, uh, wanted to spend a few minutes uh, with a question and answer with Susan, and then we can have a panel discussion between uh, both Kara and, and Susan to reflect on, on what we've heard today. I would invite participants to I'll continue to post questions in the chat, and we'll um, address those uh, uh, on a on a question by question basis. Um, for it's Susan, I think I'd like to start with uh, questions of clarity, and then we can go into some more uh, substantive questions. I think for both uh, uh, Kara and Susan. So, Susan, just a couple of questions that have come up. Um, back to the slide on. Uh, the, the data-wise improvement process. There's a question about what sorts of data you were looking at. Is that assessment data only? Well, actually, every building really did an understanding of student assessment and their climate reports. And so they did surveys within their buildings. Um, some, some students at the high school level were also surveyed. So there was actually a diverse 
way in which we began to understand what the root causes were at some of the buildings for learner center problems. So assessment data was not sufficient. Not only that, assessment data, as everyone knows, there's short-term, medium-term, and long-term data. So we had multiple forms of data. We also had student surveys, uh, parent surveys, teacher climate surveys to actually help us to begin to really look at a learner center problem and a problem of practice, meaning that what were the instructional practices that we found effective that were in need of tweaking to be able to address the learner center problems. Um, I think that the other question that was asked was, you know, is actual student outcome data really showing improvement in New Rochelle? And while our state assessment scores are not released yet, and I think that most school districts, states, look at the final state assessment data, we have actually um, several formative assessment periods throughout our entire school district. And we actually use a program called Star Renaissance Learning that actually is used throughout our system to look at that short-term data as well as the medium-term data um, for teachers that have created assessments for student learning objectives. So we're actually seeing growth. We're seeing improvement. We've seen a really nice trajectory of student growth in our percentiles, not only for students but for classes. Um, and what we're nicely seeing is a slow improvement of our students in, with high needs, for example, those students with economically disadvantaged populations as well as students with disabilities and English language learners. Great. Thanks, Thanks Susan. And that, uh, I think, captures both the questions for clarity. And again, I'd invite participants, if you have further questions, to please uh, post those uh, in, in the chat. Um, but before we go on to um, a couple of the questions for both of you that have came up through the registration process and, and also building on what we've heard today, um, Kara, there was a question that we just wanted to circle back to um, on your presentation, and Susan, also feel free to chime in. Of, of do you know, do you have or know of anything published that underscores the point you you, you make about trust in organizational learning? Yeah, um, good question. So there's a couple of things that um, there's a recent article. They're on the list that I had earlier in publications, but just to call your attention to them, there's one called "Mind the Gap: Learning Trust and Relationships in an Underperforming Urban District," and another called "Exploring the Space Between Social Networks, Trust, and Urban School District Leaders." One is in the American Journal of Education, and the other is the Journal of School Leadership, and they're both with my colleague um, Alan Daly and. Um, if you access some of those links that I had put on the PowerPoint, you can find them there. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Kara, for that uh, sure. for that clarification. Um, so I think uh, just looking at the the chat and um, reflecting on some of the questions we've heard today, as well as when uh, participants registered for the event. Um, I think I can I'll start in general, uh, Kara, with some of the things that you you heard um, Susan say today uh, about the the success of the DataWise implementation to date. Um, are there signs of organ, organizational learning that that you see and and what she talked about? Well, I think that um, you know. Clearly, it was very nicely aligned um, with the kinds of things I was talking about and the kinds of things they were doing in practice. And actually, one of the things that I thought was interesting were, um, you know, the kind of going back to the question of we all know because it came up in the poll that there that any one of these particular points can be a challenge. So whether it's diagnosing problems or questioning assumptions or things like that, and so. Um, it, it clearly was following the same kinds of processes, and I was curious from Susan whether she had found in their own work um, whether certain of those, you know, phases or points, depending on which way you look at them, but had been more challenging for them. Because I guess I, I think it would be probably helpful for people out there to hear where the where were the harder points of um, changing the way people were working or or. Was this always the kind of orientation people had had in your district? Well, I think the thing is that the orientation in our district is that we've always been very technical in our understanding of data. So 
many of our leaders as well as our teachers had a very good understanding of assessment data, long, short, medium term data. However, I think the question that you raised, and just to go back to the slides that you were talking about, and I think that there was actually a poll about uh, what is the most difficult thing for leaders to actually do. And I think the respondents had talked about recognizing, revising, and you know, actually really doing the work of changing practices, changing those attitudes, changing the actual underlying behavior that may be what is causing the organization to continually uh, not improve in a trajectory that will increase student achievement. And I think that that was an area that was really eye-opening for us as a school, as school district, um, one in which we began to really begin to look at instructional improvement by opening our doors for peer observations. And that, I think, was probably the most heartwarming experience for many of the individuals that were on the data teams, primarily because I think that teachers often do the most public act in private. And they were finally able to have individuals that were on their data teams as well as members of their schools come into their classroom and provide effective feedback. And so this is care and trust that happened from this process for the last two years that allowed teachers to open up their doors, which also then allowed for effective feedback that was really on a building of knowledge that they had received with professional development for over the last two years. So there's a real gradual release of that. It's not as though we said, hey, open up your doors. We're going to come in. It was one in which teachers volunteered. And then not one teacher, not two, two teachers, but several teachers began to do that. And then once they began to do that, they became actually really effective in diagnosing what were the instructional practices that they needed greater professional development on. And as a result, the data teams would be able to call that information and the district would be able to provide for them um, more uh, effective professional development from a consultant or from a critical friends group or from a leader in the field and come to the schools to be able to do that. And one of the things that we were able to do as a result of that was to increase the uh, SIOP model, which is a, a sheltered observation model for English language learners. But what it did was it helped us to understand that we are actually now increasing our tool set to be able to provide instructional strategies for all students and for all learners. Great. Thanks, Thanks Susan. Um, and Kara, and again, I, I really love this perspective of both the, the researcher and the practitioner here um, in addressing some of these questions. And um, I think another question that um, many of our participants will be curious about as, as practitioners, and we uh, heard a number of during the registration process, sort of generally fit into the theme of what's next. So I'll start with Kara on this one. Uh, for those in roles as policy and decision makers in their organizations, um, and those many of those may be on the webinar, are on the webinar today, um, and are interested in taking the next step of leveraging organizational learning, um, what is that first next step you would recommend that they, they take? Um, I think that that's a good question. I mean, the, I, I'm assuming there's two different groups of people out there that you might be talking about. One are people who can advocate around policy change and one who might be actually working closely with um, state, I'm mean, sorry, district and local leaders. So let me take the second group first because that's probably the easier group in a way. Um, I think that really just trying to, as you work with school and district leaders, trying to understand for yourself what this process is and maybe consider how in the past, I mean, this is this has probably been going on already where they've been working with these groups and understanding maybe where some of the gaps were. So was it, you know, a solution from outside that didn't have the internal capacity inside to move forward? Or was it a problem, as we've talked about a lot, that didn't, you know, that root cause wasn't identified and really kind of, you know, 
starting over and reflecting on what's already happened and trying to sort of move closer to this process that Susan talked about or that I was talking about in terms of learning and um, you know co-construction of the problem and that kind of thing. So I would say it, it would be maybe starting to step back and see, well, where, where are these schools or districts in that process? And how can we kind of pull them back into this, air, uh, this way of thinking about data and interpreting it and using it that will lead to, you know, lead to longer term improvements rather than short term change? Um, the flip side of that is the first group, the ones who are more likely to be sort of advocating for policies, and I think that that's, that's the tougher one. I mean, two big areas that I think jump out for me are this idea of capacity building that I don't think we've done necessarily a great job with in terms of our state systems of support and things like that. Um, the sanctions sort of have taken over more than the capaci capacity building has. And the other, I think, has to do a lot with how we train leaders. I mean, I think that both leaders who are going into these systems, especially the more challenging schools and districts, but leaders that are already there, I mean, I think they, you know, any one of them will tell you there's so much professional development they have to do to keep up with their, you know, credential and things, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about really understanding how to not just access the data. I think we've done a better job of that. I mean, here at the U of R, we have data-driven instruction. You know, we have these kinds of courses, but that's a different kind of thing to help people learn how to actually interpret it and use it in these processes that they would then bring into their schools, or maybe if they're already in the schools and districts. I think it's a great idea. I mean, I saw, I was so happy to see some of the teams um, that were on this, this webinar because I think that's a start. Like having teams of people who are already coming together and thinking about these things is a very different kind of leadership development than having individuals go out and take a course here and there. And so I think rethinking the way we think about how we develop leaders after they're already in their positions and especially in the lowest performing schools and districts. Great. Great. Thanks, Thanks Kara. Um, and I would now turn that over to Susan to just reflect on if there any anything to add. I think in in general, again on this as a practitioner, that sort of that first next step uh, you would recommend for. I think that there's several layers um, as a practitioner that one would have to consider is you know district leadership and then building leadership and then teacher leadership. And I think that what's really important about what Carol was stating was where do you start is that there needs to be a real comprehensive approach, a systematic approach to how you're going to actually build in a, a system of leaders where it's not just one leader that if they were to leave the system, what would happen to that system. And I think from our experience and what we've seen is that by including all 10 schools, not, you know, piecemeal, but it was all 10 schools that actually are part of this um, initiative. In addition to that, we had teams that were very diverse. They were not reflective of only the individuals that are the ones that have the voice in on the staff, but there were individuals that had perspectives that were keen to our student population that we may not necessarily understand. So again, going back to that idea of building capacity means about effectively creating teams that actually learn how to not only understand the data and the work, but really about how do we create effective teaming? How do we build leadership teams? How do we build teams that can effectively distribute this work, not only to the individuals that are um, motivated, but those individuals who may be skeptical that this may not be an effective way, or those individuals that may actually need to be um, drawn out. And, you know, I, I can't emphasize the importance of building that human capital and social capital together. And oftentimes professional development at the district level um, for, for most practitioners is a talk to basis. And, and then go back to your buildings and figure out what you're going to do. But the approach that we took was we want you to be able to use these professional development sessions to build effective teams, teams that not only have the skills, but they actually establish norms and a culture of collaboration that then accelerates the amount and the quantity of leaders in a building to be able to support the instructional needs 
of not only teachers but students as well. So, you know, in that approach, I feel as though when there is a real understanding about what really moves the heart of individuals to change, and, you know, I think that much of the research has shown that effective uh, leaders can attract effective teachers, and effective teachers will work in schools that are lower performing when they have effective principals and leaders. And I think that building that capacity on a district perspective and then actually having that come down the layers will support those districts who want to facilitate the use of data in improving student achievement. Wow, great. Thanks, Thanks Susan. And I, I really like that perspective. And there's one question that just came in, uh, just as Kara was finishing up, and you started, Susan, and I think this is a, this builds on that is um, it's related to effective leadership, and that the statement is that principals have limited power to influence the system to address improvement needs needed in the system. Uh, this may be especially true in low-performing schools and rural districts. And a statement that I think some of the social network analysis might support that statement. Um, and any any thoughts on that? Um, I, Susan, did you want to jump in first, or should I? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, I think this kind of gets back to something Susan was talking about in the way that an orientation of the district as the organization. I mean, I, I have actually heard that from principals, sort of like, what can we do about this? And I think it speaks to the fragmentation in a lot of our urban districts that that they're not they're not all at the table. I mean, that the central office sort of says says what to do, and the principals are supposed to carry it out. And they and it sort of shows you in those slides how central office rarely went to the principals for things. But there's so much knowledge <clears throat> that the principals would bring to the table if they were more equal partners in kind of moving forward. And so, I mean, I think that the reality is is that principals feel limited power to influence the system in places that don't have them kind of helping in this moving, you know, understanding the problem and moving things forward, whereas it sounds like from the way Susan was describing it, and I think to kind of speak to the way that, you know, the culture that sounds like it's developed there is that it doesn't seem like they would feel that kind of uh, fragmentation or disjuncture that the participant was mentioning. And, you know, I just want to add to that that principals may think they have limited power, but actually principals wield a lot more power than they actually know that they possess. And I think that principals actually have a lot of power because they can actually establish the culture of trust and norms of collaboration, irregardless of what supports or what mandates, is that the relationship that may expand from one person to the next person to the one teacher that then spreads the good news about that principal who spoke to that teacher that was reaffirming. And I, I want to be an advocate for the principal who actually does have a lot of opportunity to grow that culture of trust and collaboration in their schools. And it often does start with just one person and that one person becoming the next person and developing that network within the building to actually be able to withstand the exter external demands and pressures from increased accountability. I mean, I think the other thing that um, is, is sort of the person is alluding to is that, you know, this kind of gets back to trust, right? And so when there is trust, there is a feeling of empowerment, and there's more reciprocity, so there's more give and take, and so it's almost like it's circular, right? And it gets better and better. Um, and I think that Susan's, you know, Susan's point is sort of it has to start somewhere, and I think a lot of times the leadership in central office is the place where that might start when there hasn't been that in the past, almost like rebuilding. You know, the, the district I showed you where from year one to year two, those kinds of emotional ties that totally deteriorate that's a lot of rebuilding to do, and there's a lot of distrust in that system that sort of speaks to the challenges ahead. And so, you know, at that point, it's almost like regrouping and figuring out how do we build trust again because all the reforms we try to put into place and all of the data we give people access to is not going to really change the fact that nobody trusts each other and the system can't move forward without it. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Kara and, and Susan both. And I think that answers uh, some of the questions that we're seeing 
in the chat that are still coming up. And I think we'll take one more question. And we did have a number of questions in the chat today. And, and as Andrew mentioned, we'll get out a full question and answer document and try to uh, and provide a, uh, a transcript of, of this webinar is available as well. Um, and I, yeah, I, th I think you really addressed these, but the couple that just came up from Dan Pierre, how can the de decreased trust be avoided when putting structures in place to increase the network? And Care, I think if, if any additional thoughts on that? Um, I think it's just the, well, it's, I guess it depends. I, I mean, most of the places that I am in, there, the trust is already decreased, and so it's a matter of rebuilding. Uh, uh, and I think the challenge is rebuilding it in a context where people don't just just trust because of the kind of past history there, but because of the evaluative processes that have now been put into place. I mean, particularly in New York, where there's a lot of stress in the system because of the ways um, you know teachers and principals are being evaluated, and so that I think is just having you know having to tackle both of those at once makes it a little bit more challenging. So it's really starting. You know, I think that kind of getting back to how do you I mean how do you have these kinds of processes without having them be tied to evaluation and that is key because until that happens then you won't be able to have the kind of open conversations that Susan was talking about where they're really trying to understand problems I mean if that's at all tied to evaluation that's just not going to be possible and so I think it's maybe thinking within the systems both within schools and districts how do you kind of tease apart those things to allow improvement to happen and be very clear about how, you know, how those are separated out so that you don't have people who, you know, if they do question things, how things are done or raise questions about what the data means, that wouldn't come back as a repercussion for their position. And I just want to, there's been a lot in the chat rooms about literature on trust and, you know, I, and I'm using a lot of the research from Susan Moore Johnson's work on new teachers especially and the high turnover of new teachers in schools, especially lower performing schools. And a lot of the research shows that if they had um, opportunities or structures in place to increase collaboration and to develop um, norms of trust in those environments, that there may have been a likelihood that they might have wanted to stay in those lower performing schools. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, really go back to what kind of structures did we put in place? And, you know, I think that that's actually a really important part of building trust is if we're saying that we're reciprocally accountable to the work that you're doing, that means that we're providing trust for you. Well, what does that look like? That means that we're providing resources to increase time on time for uh, for teams to meet, and I think that that's I, I think that's actually one of the largest structures that most of our participants have said over and over again in our surveys is, you're telling us to do something, but you haven't given us the time, and so putting in a structure of time and doing it on a regular, consistent basis developing leaders within the building to be able to lead those sessions effectively um, were two things that I felt were critical to our success for this process. So, you know, I think that decreased trust is actually giving people time to collaborate, giving them the room to do that, not after school, not before school, but finding time and being really strategic about scheduling and so forth. So those are some different um, applications that we have had in our district. Great, thanks, thanks, Susan. Uh, wonderful, um, wonderful responses there, and I think some some practical um, resources for folks to think about. And thanks again, Kara, and Susan both today for uh, the fantastic presentations. Um, being respectful of everyone's time on our webinar today, we we have about five minutes left. Um, and I will spend that time first as a reminder to folks, uh, Peter has been good enough to post uh, links to the webinar where it will be posted. That's available in the chat. This chat will also be available. Um, and we'll send out a question and answer document to participants, as well as a reminder to everyone that we would love to hear your feedback today. Um, uh, Peter will insert the uh, link to the evaluation for this event, and uh, again, we really um, would like to hear from you and, and things that we did well today and things that we can do better. Um, so before uh, signing off, I just want to spend a, a few minutes reviewing 
uh, the work of the REL Northeastern Islands and the Urban School Improvement Alliance specifically, um, sort of the host of today's event, uh, of which Susan Yam is a, a core member of that Urban School Improvement Alliance. Um, since this the research alliance kicked off uh, in late winter of 2012, uh, it's articulated the goal of helping build the capacity of LEA members to use and access data. Um, the Alliance is working together to facilitate the pursuit of coherent research agendas uh, within state and local agencies, developing relationships to help uh, share information and improve data use, as well as the building capacity in districts um, to inform questions of policy and practice. And so um, we're, the Alliance, in collaboration with the REL Northeastern Islands, is pursuing a number of uh, specific projects, or has pursued or is pursuing. Uh, one of them is improving the relationships with external researchers, uh, an identified need of the Alliance. Uh, REL has prepared a suite of materials to help mid-sized urban districts better work with external resource researchers. Those resources are available uh, to everyone on the, the REL Northeastern Islands website. Uh, the REL is also undertaking an administrator and school board study uh, to examine the ways that district administrators are using data, uh, particularly in low-performing schools. And then finally, um, a number of school and district survey modules have been developed and are in the process of being rolled out to capture data on leadership, data use, family involvement, school environment, and instruction. So that's just a, a little bit about uh, our host organization today in terms of the REL Northeastern Islands and the Urban School Improvement Alliance. Um, and for additional information, I would invite everyone participating today to visit the REL Northeastern Islands website. That's uh, relne.org for information on the work of the REL Northeastern Islands in general and the uh, Urban School Improvement Alliance specifically. Uh, and when you're on the site, you can register for information on research and activities of USIA and the REL in general. And I would also note that if you're interested in having your school district pursue a deeper level of engagement and possible membership with the Urban School Improvement Alliance, they should feel free to contact um, any one of the folks you see here on the USA, USIA REL knee support team, Andrew Seeger, Anthony Petrosino, uh, Anthony Petrosino uh, or myself, Dave Phillips. So we uh, really appreciate everyone's participation today. And um, that's it. Thanks, Thank uh, you so much, uh, everyone. And I'll turn it back over to Peter for a final close. Yeah, thanks everybody, and thank you David, Anthony, Andrew from USIA, Kara Finnegan, um, and Susan Yam. It was a great session. So there'll be a, uh, an archive of the webinar on the event archive of the RELNI website in a couple of days. You'll also get an email uh, with a link to that in the slides, and uh, we'll explore whether to put together a Q&A document. I think we very well may, and that will also appear on the website. Have a great afternoon, and thanks again for attending. Bye-bye. Uh, Peter, I'll just uh, butt in to say thank you for our production crew of uh, Jennifer and Jenny. We most appreciate their support.